Hi, welcome to Teardown Tuesday. Where's the thing I'm going to tear down? Well, sitting on top of my video camera and I'm using it right now to record the audio for this video. It's the Zoom H1 Handy Recorder and here it is. Well, I might be peeking a little bit. Check, check, check. Definitely going to peek there. It's a little uh, handy uh, WAV MP3 stereo recorder and it's got an external mic out and you can use it to uh, record stuff for your video. Let's check it out. And here it is. It's a very nice little compact bit of kit and I love it. It uh, retails for like under a hundred bucks and it's a stereo uh, MP3 or a WAV recorder. It's got a selectable MP3 WAV switch on the back there. Let's have a look at this. It's got a uh, auto uh, volume level on and off. It's got uh, a low cut filter which is great for uh, uh, actually cutting out uh, low frequency noise and possibly some um, handhold noise if you're using it as a handheld mic. It's powered from a single AA cell in here. It's got a standard um, thread on top for mounting on top of your camera or on a little mini tripod and uh, it's got a nice uh, LCD on it which um, has a proper VU level meter. It's got a basic uh, start stop record uh, function and it's got a power switch, it's got USB uh, interface so it can be used as a USB mic and it's got uh, some basic uh, uh, playback uh, commands, input level so you can have auto or manual uh, level, level set and it actually has an external microphone input as well so if you want to use a better quality handheld mic or something like you can stick this thing in your pocket and you can use like a external handheld uh, mic then uh, well you can certainly uh, do that use it as a portable recorder or a uh, line in as well so you can use it to record stuff from like a tape deck or uh, something like that it's got a uh, clip um, level indicator here so if your uh, input clips then it'll show you that and it's got um these stereo microphones down in here and uh, they're in this crisscross uh, fashion because that makes them equidistant wank word of the day equidistant from the source regardless of where the audio source is if it's right out here or if it's out here or if it's in front like this these are the same distance so there's no phase difference between um, if you had a traditional uh, stereo microphone they would have two separate uh, mics like might be out here and if your source is over here there's different uh, lengths to get to each microphone so by putting them in this cross configuration like this they uh, just work and apparently it reduces the uh, any uh, phase any um, issues due to uh, phase and it's supposed to increase the stereo image in and all that sort of audio wank word stuff but there you go it's a very nice little handy recorder oh and it's got uh, volume and a speaker on the bottom as well and it's got a micro SD card in there to record your uh, stuff directly on it's a very nice little recorder I love it so let's open up this thing and uh, see what's inside now I expect a uh, micro processor I don't know what uh, type it'll probably have an M because it's got mp3 uh, encoding uh, capability maybe there's a separate uh, mp3 encoder chip or something like that or maybe it's built into the main micro and there'll be an analog to digital uh, converter as well that'll be a 24-bit type because this thing's capable um, it's got a 24-bit analog to digital converter up to 96 kilohertz uh, sample rate so you know it's pretty high-end stuff I expect there to be some uh, shielding uh, in there because we're talking about you know a 24-bit uh, converter so um, there won't be a terribly uh, a terrible amount uh, more than that ADC and a micro and uh, maybe an mp3 encoder and some miscellaneous uh, circuitry some uh, level um, stuff so there'll be some analog input circuitry but that's probably about it the micro probably uh, controls the uh, SD writes directly to the SD card and well I don't know we'll find out let's open it looks like we've got two screws there and let's see if there's a, another screw inside the battery compartment doesn't look like it so uh, take out these two screws for starters and maybe it just uh, lifts off like that using my spudger here to there we go it's got a clip in there and a clip in there and it's probably got another one up the back here but it looks like it separates 
like that. So, yep, bingo, looks like there's another clip up the back. And, ta-da, there it is. Now that's rather interesting. The first thing I notice, of course, is this uh, copper shield in here on top of this board. It's soldered at a couple of points down in there, and uh, that's rather interesting. I guess they decided, it's almost as if maybe it's a, uh, maybe it's an afterthought. I'd have to have a look at the uh, uh, PCB pattern down in there. But anyway, we've got our uh, flat flex cable going over to the uh, switch uh, switches on the back of the unit here, so um, it looks a uh, fairly uh, compact. They've really uh, jammed a fair bit of uh, electronics physically in here. These uh, these uh, tall uh, surface mount electrolytic capacitors fit in this space up along here, and uh, this board here is clearly the uh, DC to DC converter because. You need that because it's only a single cell. It's only 1.5 volts. I don't know what voltage it actually uh, operates down to. Maybe 1.1 minimum or if it would be nicely designed it might be 1 volt or 0.9 volts minimum. But um, uh, you obviously need a uh, boost step up DC to DC converter for that. And uh, I looked at that chip under the uh, microscope and it doesn't. Uh, it's not readily identifiable. It uses some uh, weird code mark. But uh, there you go. It's a basic boost Converter, you can see the uh, gold test points there, 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 and there. There for the production uh, test jig. They would have a bed of nails uh, tester that they would test each individual board on. Now this is rather curious. They've got the USB uh, mini B connector there, connected, uh, soldered onto the DC to DC converter board up the top here. And uh, really, that's very, that's quite strange because you'd have to get the uh, data connections off this board, so presumably it's got a, either there's a ribbon cable under the bottom that connects down to the bottom board, presumably where the processor is, or it's got to go through the DC to DC converter and uh, somewhere else. Oh, there could be a processor over here, perhaps. I haven't lifted that flap up there, but it's got to get those data connections all the way through that DC to DC converter. That's just a rather unusual placement for the USB connector. And check out the uh, footprints there for those little uh, surface mount resistors or capacitors there. They've got no solder mask removed so they've decided that they don't uh, want, want to mount those components and they've actually uh, haven't, they've actually uh, closed off the solder mask for those so there's no solder on those pads at all. Um, that's not uh, fairly common. Usually on unpopulated footprints like that you would just leave the solder mask open and you'd see the uh, reflow solder on those pads but not in this case. Now let's take a look at this side of the top board, the, or the blue board as we'll uh, call it here, and uh, there's this plastic, is that, looks like uh, plastic protecting, uh, there's another copper shield under all of that, and that's not uh, very surprising because these are your uh, input and output connectors here, so this is all your uh, audio stuff, your analog to digital uh, converter and your uh, DAC and stuff will be all under there and possibly, well the um, actual processor is probably down on the bottom green board down in here and I'd say this is uh, all of your ADC and uh, amplifier uh, stuff because it's got to drive the speaker which is all the way over here by the way and uh, so let's take a look, let's lift up that, lift up the skirt and see if we can find anything under there. We may actually have to desolder the shield. Jeez, I hope not. And of course you can see the microphone connections there and there as well so this is really uh that's why it needs all the shielding and uh i can't seem to get that plastic off it seems to be stuck down well and truly ad adhesive stuck to the uh copper board there so looks like we are going to have to desolder that bummer There's the circuitry underneath. There's a couple of devices there. I'll put those under the microscope and see if I can get some numbers. And there's the main device there. It's a Texas Instruments AC3101. So we'll have to check out the data sheet for that. Well, no major surprises at all. It's an off-the-shelf stereo audio codec from Texas Instruments. It's, it's a TLV320 AIC3101. They don't put uh, the extra... Uh, info on there, they just stamp the chip uh, 3101, but you search for it and it uh, 
pops up no problems at all. It's got a DAC and an ADC. The uh, stereo audio uh, DAC here has got a 102 dB signal to noise ratio, um, uh, sample rates up to 96 kilohertz. It's got some uh, wanky effects as well, bass, treble, 3D stuff and de-emphasis and things like that. They're probably not used in this particular uh, product. And the stereo uh, ADC down here at 92 dB signal to noise ratio supports sample rates up to 96 kilohertz, hence the spec on this thing. It's a, uh, classed as a 24-bit analog to digital converter up to 96 kilohertz sample rate. Um, it's got some DSP stuff as well and noise filtering available. I'm not sure if they actually use that. They may. It's software selectable. And it's actually got uh, six audio inputs. It's got one stereo pair single-ended, it's got one stereo pair fully differential inputs, um, and it's got six audio output drivers. Wow, it can drive uh, differential and single-ended headphones, it can drive stereo line outputs, hence this thing's capable of uh, dual headphone and line out uh, capability. Um, and it's got a 500 milliwatt um, speaker driver as well. They're probably not uh, driving it that hard in this thing. It's only a tiny speaker in there, but it's capable of doing that. It's low power. It only takes 14 milliwatts um, during uh, playback. It's a 3.3 analog supply. Oh, what else we've got? It's got automatic gain control, which uh, there's that switch on the unit, which um, uh, selects uh, automatic gain control on the input or manual. Um, it supports, um, it has microphone bias as well built in. You would need that for these uh, electric uh, microphone inserts and uh, it's got an I2C control bus for setting the data and it uses the, uh, no surprise, as most of these audio class uh, codecs do, they use the um, I2S, uh, not to be confused with I2C, I2S uh, audio interface, um, industry standard type thing and it's in a 5mm by 5mm 32 pin QFN. And let's take a look at the block diagram and it contains a lot of uh, analog and digital stuff that would ordinarily require a an awful lot of uh, separate uh, discrete circuitry. So um, the inputs here, it's got uh, a programmable gain amp from 0 to uh, almost 60 dB in half dB steps. Wow, going into the ADC. It's got the auto gain control there. It's got uh, line inputs. It's got the microphone amplifier here and a summer. And there's the uh, I2S uh, audio uh, interface and uh, it's got some switches, the effects processor down here, volume controls, and then another DAC. Oh, geez, and then the output, all the output uh, mucks in for the um, uh, headphone uh, outputs and the line outputs as well, and the, of course, all the uh, I squared C control in, uh, uh, data interface and uh, the clock generation as well, and then the microphone biases and the different voltage supplies it needs. It's a really heavily integrated device. And if you take a look at the typical circuit configuration here, you can see that uh, it, the I2S interface connects to a DSP or an application processor. We could have, yeah, a DSP or a microcontroller, but because this has to do MP3 encoding, unless there's a separate MP3 encoder uh, chip on the other board, which we haven't uh, seen yet, which is uh, quite likely, then it would need a fairly heavy uh, DSP because it's not easy to do MP3 encoding on a low-end microcontroller, but uh, pretty basic stuff. It's got the uh, microphone, um, electric microphone input here with the microphone bias supply, AC coupled, pretty standard stuff. Um, line inputs here, also AC coupled. Uh, another uh, line input here, and uh, well, it's got a whole bunch of line inputs and then the uh, um, headphone uh, driver down here, an external audio uh, power amp, so it's recommending um, if, you know, a separate external amp if you want to uh, drive uh, a decent uh, type of uh, speaker load instead of uh, headphones and uh, lots of decoupling over here for the built-in uh, supplies. So uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, stuff. Analog VDD is rated from 2.7 to 3.6 and also needs uh, for the I.O. as well go, can go down to 1.1 volts uh, to 3.3. So that's rather neat. And that's all there is to it, and you'll basically uh, find that uh, all this stuff will be mirrored on the PCB. It's just got a whole bunch of uh, coupling uh, caps and decoupling caps and a couple of pull-up resistors, and that's about all, and that's what we see on the board. Now, this is rather interesting. I highly recommend you uh, read 
the data sheet if you want to know how the uh, AGC setting works. I haven't uh, read the manual for this thing. Maybe it explains fairly well, but this is, you know, coming from the horse's mouth directly from the uh, chip manufacturer's data sheet because AGCs, automatic gain controls, can be rather tricky. And if you use them, um, you know, you've got to know exactly how they work under what conditions otherwise you could end up with uh, things that are clipped or too low and audio that's all over the shop so you want to know about the decay time and that's actually uh, selectable so who knows what uh, decay time that they're actually uh, using that and uh, what they've uh, set that in software um, hard-coded that into the uh, firmware of this thing so if you go down here it can show you your uh, input signals and your output signals and how it uh, adjusts that in uh, real time. So if I'm recording like a lecture or something like that, I'll set the level up, up manually, I'll place the thing, set it up so that I know that uh, it's going to give me a consistent uh, audio level and I don't have to rely on uh, any uh, tricky business happening in the um, AGC. And uh, there's a digital audio processing for playback and there's all sorts of stuff in this data sheet so I highly recommend you uh, uh, check it out if you're interested in how this sort of stuff works and the di digital interpolation filter and ah the Delta Sigma audio DAX it's all in here it's great stuff excellent bedtime reading and the other part is a JRC 2100 A04 not familiar we'll have to check it out maybe it's uh, some sort of uh, uh, you know, uh, dual op amp or a uh, dual microphone amplifier or something like that. And I was right on the money on the other uh, device. The JRC2100 is actually an NJM or New Japan uh, Radio 2100 dual operational amplifier. <laughs> no funny business going on there at all. It's just a uh, low operating voltage, plus minus one volt to plus minus 3.5 volt single supply operation dual op amp. No more to say there. And if we have a look at the uh, dual board construction here, uh, I was able to lift out the microphone insert over here and you can see the uh, board to board interconnect they've got down here. And uh, there we go, we can see the bottom board, we can see the uh, side switches directly, uh, right angle side tack switches directly soldered onto there. Some test pads, that would be for programming the microcontroller, that would be the JTAG uh, interface. I haven't even looked at the uh, silk screen there, but that's obvious what that is. A couple of more uh, side tactile switches up here. There's the uh, uh, flat flex uh, cable directly soldered onto the board. A whole bunch of resistors neatly uh, laid out in uh, lines. I like that when you're uh, laying out a board. It's rather neat. And uh, let's go in and see if we can find out what sort of uh, processor that thing is. And you can see the uh, other bunch of electrolytic uh, caps for the, uh, de uh, for the uh, coupling. Um, input and output uh, coupling here. These large ones would be uh, for the output coupling for the headphones and another and some of those would be used for the input coupling as well. One rather interesting thing to note is you'll notice that the shield of the USB connector has this black wire running all the way up to uh, presumably one of the uh, grounds up here, one of the analog grounds right up there which might be connected through to the shield on the top, I'm not sure, but uh, obviously that's like a maybe an afterthought perhaps, um, or maybe that was the uh, easiest and best way they could get that all the way back to that on the double-sided board. Uh, who knows? But uh, they've obviously had to do that to uh, uh, get uh, the noise down in some uh, way, shape or form. And you'll also notice the extra circuitry in here for the uh, DC to DC boost converter. Now if I take out these little uh, plastic clips either side here for the uh, uh, plus minus buttons, then the board seems to seems to lift out somehow, perhaps, very gingerly. I don't know, this could be tricky. I might have to uh, get some pliers there and pull it out vertically, perhaps. And there we go, I got it. Aha! There we go, now we've got some serious stuff happening. Awesome. And bingo, there was too much uh, happening to all be on that one tiny chip on the top, so obviously we've got some sort of processor here, we'll check it out, one of these is probably the MP3 encoder, we've got our SD card directly mounted on the board, another device over here, our tab mounted uh, LCD 
custom LCD display over here, our carbonized PCB button which connects to the rubber uh, button for the front panel for the record switch and a few miscellaneous things and a real-time uh, clock for the time and date. That's the 32 uh, kilohertz crystal. And there's another uh, surface mount connector up here which they decided not to populate. And there we go, the main processor is a DSP. It's the classic uh, Texas Instruments TMS320 series. And the first device we've got up there is an EN39SL800 and that's an 8 megabit flash memory. And the other device we have there is a Core Magic. I uh, haven't heard of them before, but it's a CMS 3216LAH-75. And I believe that's actually an SRAM. So there you go. We have a uh, Texas Instruments TMS320 DSP processor. We have external flash and we have external SRAM. Now, interestingly, this is a TMS320C5504. And it already has... Uh, 256k of built-in SRAM and 128k of ROM. That's not a huge amount of ROM, but it is a lot of SRAM, but maybe they need a lot more. So uh, given given the proximity of these two devices to uh, the TMS320 up here, this does actually support external memory up to 4 megs. So it's most likely that they are actually external uh, flash and SRAM for the TMS320 processor. Now, the thing that's missing, of course, is the MP3 encoder capability and that's either built in to the TMS uh, 320 and I'm sure it's probably uh, capable of doing that but there's this mysterious device over here which we couldn't identify which is close to the connector uh, going through to the top audio boards. But of course one thing the TMS 320 processor is not going to have is an LCD driving capability, especially to drive all the segments that are actually on this display. It's a large number of segments. So um, clearly, also given the uh, location of this uh, micro here, it's it's pretty obvious that uh, this is the LCD controller because uh, it's close to the uh, tab, uh, the tab connections on the uh, left hand side there. So that's some sort of maybe custom or uh, rebadged LCD controller. And that means that the MP3 uh, encoding must be done in the TMS320 processor. Hence, probably all the extra uh, external uh, SRAM and ROM required. And for those curious about the copper shield in here, that's uh, clearly all over this uh, digital circuitry here. Because we've got parallel uh, buses running between uh, the external memories and the uh, DSP. And maybe, you know, around here we've got the SD card. So, you know, there's the uh, main crystal oscillator for it by the looks of it so all of that sort of stuff is running you know it's going to be running at a reasonable frequency and it's all going to be uh, digital stuff so they've obviously just uh, shielded on there now whether or not that's an afterthought uh, to meet uh, EMC or noise compliance or uh, something else after they did testing I'm not sure and based on the looks of uh, the pads designed into the PCB to solder this uh, copper shield in down onto it. Um, it's at least uh, thought out as part of the uh, PCB PCB design. So it's not just a you know it's not just a hack add-on or anything like that after the fact. But maybe it could have been. Maybe they did their original uh, testing and they found, oops, you know we probably need this uh, copper shield all the way over here. So they might have respun the board to uh, add in the uh, pads there for the shield. Who knows? Or they could have been smart and designed it in to begin with. Your guess is as good as mine. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed that. That's the Zoom H1 Handy Recorder. I rather like it. It's a nice, neat bit of kit. It's uh, actually uh, fairly well designed and uh, fairly compact. They've put a lot of uh, thought into maximizing uh, the amount of uh, circuitry inside the 3D envelope in the case to uh, keep this thing quite tiny. They uh, couldn't have made it uh, much smaller without a significant uh, a more amount of effort. And it's like less than a hundred bucks. So uh, if you're in the market for one of these things, I highly recommend you pick one up. They're very neat. So if you like Teardown Tuesday, please give the video a big thumbs up because that really does help a lot. And uh, if you want to discuss this thing, uh, go, jump on over to the EEV blog forum and there should be uh, some photos on my Flickr account as well for you to check out eventually. So, till next time, see ya!